Welcome to the Grappling We Re- See exactly. Grappling Rewind Podcast. Welcome to this week's episode of the Grappling Rewind, your week in review and results. I'm Josh, joined as always by Maine. Let's get it going. So for news this week, a little light on the news, Josh. So far, uh, we had Nikki Ryan calling out Gio Martinez. Gio declined. He said, or not, I don't want to do it. Uh, it's lose-lose for me. I either, you know, I beat a child, as, as he would say. I mean, he's a teenager, 16 years old, whatever. Per belt. Or I lose to a 16-year-old. So he declined. Declined. Which, honestly, it kind of does make sense. It does. But if you say you have to beat these people to, to compete against me and you somebody beat those beats people. those people... Yeah, because initially he had said you have to beat, uh, Mar- was it Marvin? Marvin Castell. And then he, he beat Castell, and he was like, okay, now you got to beat Ricky Luli. And then he beat Ricky Luli last week, so he called him out, as he had done, and then he just didn't take the match. So a little weird and kind of can understand, but... Yes and no. Don't put it out there if, if you're not going to follow through with it. So that so. happened. In other news, Sakuraba and Josh Barnett are starting a grappling organization. Quintet. And they had a cool promo out Wrestling uh, style promo is kind of awesome. Yep, and it's gonna be a five versus five um, match, super team battle. Not everybody's gonna be on the mat at first. Uh, I can't remember the name of the Japanese style of match it is, but essentially, the first two competitors go. Whoever wins stays in and fights then competes against. Doesn't fight, competes against the next guy, and you keep going, and you know people can get knocked out. So and theoretically, either, if you have Gordon Ryan first and some other people after, it could be uh, Gordon Ryan beats five guys. It could be that. Or you put somebody like that in the hole right. at the bottom of it and in case they rip through. a ringer through, at the end. Yeah. They rip through the rest of your guys. You still have. So it'll be interesting. Yeah. You know, I was actually thinking about it'd be interesting to have this. I don't think they're going to do it this way. You have like a blue belt, purple belt, brown belt, and two black belts on each team. So you start off with two blue belts. Uh, and then the, if the blue belt beats the other blue belt, you're on a purple. It'd be an interesting way to do it for me. If you do it all black belts, black belts, it's kind of who you're going to draw and how do your matchups get? Are you tired or not? It was just strategy. That's what I think the name of the game is going to be, strategy. Who's on this person's team? Okay. What's the Where, order going to be? Yeah, how we think the order is going to be and how are we going to line up against these people. Also posted today on Instagram, Gary Tonin said that he would no longer be competing in bjj competitions until after his first mma fight so kasai was his last appearance gotta wait until he puncher sizes somebody face you really think he's gonna punch size someone face not just gonna take him down with his wrestling and then grapple fuck him you really think he's gonna try why not because you're a world-class grappler i figured you kind of go use this groundwork and uh and win fast yeah i'm gonna be fed somebody I'm O and O. You're going to feed me somebody. I'm going to punch him in the face. (laughs) And then I'll take them down and choke them unconscious. But I'm going to punch somebody first. So that's about all we have for news. Moving on. Knee slicing into the first topic of tonight. Fight to win Pro 57 out of San Jose. This event paid out a total of $24,728 in commissions and salaries. Had a 53% finish rate, 16 out of 30 matches. Went to submission, and Fight to Win has now paid out their goal of over a million dollars to the athletes this year. This was their last event to get it done, and they did. Josh, what's the number? They got it done. One million five thousand two hundred and ninety-nine dollars paid out in commissions and purses to the competitors. Uh, they put fighters, but I'm going to say competitors. Nobody's punching anybody. It's great. I mean, it's these great, guys. I, I love that they pay. The athletes and this year and in a calendar year you paid out bjj guys and like local guys too a million plus dollars in salaries they said they're gonna do it in february and they got it done so congrats they also to donated a big chunk of money to the hurricane relief so that took away from that so they could have been above that already but they donated to the hurricane harvey my my hurricane name it was a little hurricane recall. pack this year yeah, that that took away a chunk of the money from from that. Not that saying that's bad or anything. They 
you know, did they did it for a good cause. So you can't complain that you didn't hit the mark when you donated to a good cause. They did hit the mark. It just took a couple months longer. So yeah, you know, big ups longer. to them. Paying out the athletes a million dollars this year. That is, you know, that is really unprecedented for a grappling tournament. So. I got some of that money, so I can't complain either. You know, thanks everybody for buying tickets and whatnot. $52,000 was raised for Hurricane Harvey victims. So again, awesome, awesome job, guys. Shout out to Seth and everyone at Fight to Win Pro. Running through the results really quick before we talk about some of the matches. We're going to start at Purple Belt. From bottom to top, Josh Cisneros defeats Chris Hendricks by triangle. Baldwin Chu defeats Laird Anderson by decision. Matthew Rice, brother of Tanner Rice, defeats Yepi Tomasian by armbar. Alan Sanchez defeats Andy Murasaki by split decision. Fight Got of the night. Fight of the night for the purple belts. Kalen Walbridge defeats Alex Barcelona by armbar. Brian Gurgis defeats Kalo Masui by decision. Tylen Brandon, Tyler Brandon Shu defeats Pablo Casemiro by decision. Michael Bueno defeats Carlos Canella by split decision. Raquel Torres defeats Courtney Dubois by Ezekiel Choke, which got submission of the night for the Purple Belts. And Nicole Evangelista defeated Morgan Beverly by Ezekiel Choke for the title. Moving we, on to... Brown Belts, but we actually going to touch on the Purple Belt match later in the show. Later in the talk show thing that we're doing. Cut. Benji Silva defeated... David Mitchell by armbar, submission of the night for the brown belts. Thomas Haley defeated Derek Vaness by split decision. Canela Kahuanui, I think I, I nailed that I one. It's pretty close, Josh. Defeats Joe Cropshot by decision. Max Rudderman defeats Jacob Penigal. Oh, God. Pangelinen. Oh, man. Pangelian, I think. Neon Genesis Pangelian. By decision, Ryan Walsh de- defeats Fernando Bor- Borrego by decision. Fight of the night for brown belts. On to black belts. Marcos Torregrosa defeats Lindsay Archangel, real name, by armbar. Breno Bittencourt defeats Sam Tenko Temco by split decision. Tanner Rice defeats Jason Butcher by armbar, which was slick. Leonard Alexander Canders Jr., Defeats Trevor Ireland by decision, which got fight of the night. Nathan Mendelson defeats Dom Hoskins by armbar. Travis Maglet defeats Brian Fornesiero. That's wrong, but by rear naked choke. Nick Borbin defeats Chad Bingham by decision. Marcio Alonso defeats Felipe Borraggio Borregio by knee bar. Submission of the night. Tyler Knox defeats Chris Calderon by decision. Caleb Khan defeats Danny Bohu. Man. Borreliagen, I think is what they said. Oh, somebody can't spell then. By leg lock. Patty Fontes defeats Christina Barlin by knee bar slash injury. Cassino Vernick defeats Paul Nava by choke. And Coyotera defeats Marcelo Cohen by inside heel hook. Let's get into some of these breakdowns for the matches that happened. We're going to start off talking about the Nicole Ev- Evangelista <laughs> versus Morgan Beverly. Evangelista. Yeah, uh, that that match was actually plopped in between the black belt matches. I'm assuming because it was a title fight that that's where they put it. Or I, I don't know. I'm just going to say that is the reason. I assume because it was so far between... It didn't even put in the brown belts. They put it in the black belts. So I assume they, they're now putting their title fights in with all the black belts. The commentary staff kind of said they were doing that, but we'll we'll see if that happens in the future. Let's talk about the commentary staff really quick. Whoa. Fantastic. Wow. Mind-blowing. It was phantasmagorical. We are on thesaurus.com because we say the same words to describe things all the time. Like good and really good and fantastic. It was great. It was some of the best commentary I've heard all year. Man, this weekend was 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 commentary on point. I, if I'm not mistaken, it was Scott and Gumby from On the Mat who did commentary for Fight to Win. It was refreshing how how well explained and how how well they carried themselves 
in the commentary. Knowledge of positions, knowledge of transitions. They would see a position and they would talk about, okay, the options he has, and then most likely where the competitor was going to go from there and how they were going to do it. It was beautiful. It was great. And there was still some little bit of story time, but it did not take away from the commentary. And something would happen and they would stop talking about whatever they were talking about and say, that right there is a good move that they're doing. Knee through in the middle and oh, there's the pass. It, it makes you feel good. I'm, I'm a firm believer in when you give good things, you receive good things. It was great. Both this weekend. It was great commentary overall. Yeah. It, it, they even had um, Fitch on there at a certain briefly, point as well. And he didn't sound like an idiot, which, again, amazing. You put people on there that know about jujitsu and... And can speak well and communicate that knowledge. It's great. Yeah, yeah. So the Nicole Evangelista and Morgan Beverly match obviously interspersed in with the, 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 the black belts. It was, it, was, it was quite exciting. So the match started out with Morgan pulling guard and you know shooting immediately for De La Hiva, trying to go inverted. And Morgan or Nicole was not really having much of it. You know, it was a, the whole match, it became, it became Nicole trying to pull through and just attacking. Uh, she at one point grabbed sort of an esteem lock and went down. That's when Morgan came on top, but she was, Nicole was very aggressive the entire time, just going and going wherever she was, she was looking to move forward or, you know, get back on top. Eventually, uh, Nicole was underneath and was guard was in guard at a, at the restart. And Morgan grabbed toehold, and that was the beginning of the end for her. Uh, the transition from Nicole, she she comes up, beats the 50-50, starts crushing it down, and immediately starts going to get the underhook to attack the Ezekiel. And from there, it was just fight it, fight it, fight it, and boom, Ezekiel choke. It was it was. It was a great finish to the match, and it was a it was a good back and forth competitive match. So, again, you get a interspersed. To it. You yeah, know, go back and rewatch it. It was a, a lot of fun to see you know high level women compete, and it was interspersed with the black belts, and I think on it more. And it was a good choice that they put that there. It didn't slow down any of the action or anything like that. So, bravo to them. Nicole is the new champion. Uh, purple belt at that weight. One of the black belts, we had Caleb Khan defeating Danny. Give me the last name, Josh. Barhagian. Yeah, this is a really interesting match. Uh, a lot of leg entanglement from the Cloverleaf position. Caleb has really interesting pistol grip at one point in the pants, and it seemed to have the grip underneath of the legs, but he was maintaining a pistol grip to stop the turn of the body over. Yeah, it was, again, good entanglement. He He just slowed everything down. Uh, the some of the angles, just because of where the cameras were positioned, were not so great. But Mike Twin has camera angles on, I think, two of the corners, but they don't have other corners or sides of the mat. So sometimes you're looking straight down at a guy's head, and the action is kind of sideways to the camera. So it's hard to tell exactly where the hands are and where everything's moving inside of that position. Yeah, the finish, it looked like a several things. I think technically it was a, a knee bar. But it definitely wasn't, it wasn't a toe hold and it wasn't a straight ankle lock. I'm going to go with that. It was an e-bar. It just, from the position and where they were sitting, it looked a little, little he awkward. Had a toe hold grip when he finished it, but you couldn't quite tell if he had the pressure and yeah. the angle to finish the toe hold. It didn't look like he did, but you just couldn't quite tell. They listed it as a, as a leg lock finish is what they have a list on the results here. But we couldn't tell if it was a toe hold or a knee bar. I don't think it was a toe hold. I'm thinking no. Josh is correct here. It was probably a knee bar. Knee bar ish submission. Yeah. For me, this was a fun match to watch. I liked. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth in the entanglement and a lot of stopping the turn to escape and pull the legs out. So if you get a chance to watch this, go back and watch it. Moving on to the females, Patty Fontes defeating Christina Barlin. Barlin. This was. This was a. Uh, a very aggressive match. 
uh, Christina came literally sprinting out from the walk-in ramp, just jazzed, ready, ready to, to go. go. And she showed it. So she pulls guard immediately, and Patty said, just says, I don't care about your guard, and steps right around. Barlin recovers, starts moving around, shooting through, and Patty keeps pressure forward, pressure forward, pressure forward. But that was uh, that was her downfall of getting knocked onto her butt, and Barlin comes underneath, comes on top, and immediately starts hunting for the back. And she continues to st- continues on that back route, just once, once the back. Yeah, that's what she want. wants the entire match. You can really tell that she's looking to get the the pant grip and pull her underneath and come on, basically roll her to her the back. Well, that slowed her down at one point. She comes up on top, and Patty puts on uh, a a calf slicer. Yeah, it's like a knee. It's like a knee knee compression, yeah, or whatever compression you want to call it. Uh, what's his name from Half Gracie's? Did it a lot during the brown belt kumite. Sean Roberts. Sean Roberts did a lot during the brown belt kumite, where he would just feed the arm through, and step over with a triangle of the leg and beat up people's legs with it. Yeah, this always makes me really nervous when I see it because I blew a guy's knee out back when I was a blue belt with this accidentally. Uh, we rolled and he just accidentally. Accidentally, he looked. I was like, "Are you okay?" And he goes, "Yeah." And then he extended up and basically blew his own knee out. And I went, cool. So whenever I see this, it always makes me super uncomfortable just because I think back to that that particular instance. And both commentators made mention of how it made them uncomfortable because of knee surgery. So, you know, everybody was very wary of uh, Christina's that, leg. That particular compression lock. That was a little foreshadowing for what happens a little bit later in the match. Uh Christina gets out of that and actually ends up in an omoplata type position. She gets it. Patty starts to, you know, come around and try to come on top and eventually scoots out to the side and grabs a leg. Well, she's messing with it and extending. All of a sudden, the match stops and Christina's leg does not look correct. Good. Yeah, and I went back and actually replayed it, and you can see from the camera angle they have, she has her leg out. Like, she's kind of going to go for this knee bar, but the angle is a little sideways. Yeah. And so you watch her knee, luckily it's a gi match, you watch her knee kind of pop pretty substantially sideways. And they continue for like two or three more seconds, and then the match stops, and you go, ooh, that is a dislocated knee if I've ever seen one. And Patty did a little victory thing and then looked back and was like, oh, ugh. Yeah, she kind of stood up and was like, please, she won. But you see her face after, and she's un- she's uncomfortable about what just happened. And whoever was running the the fl- the stream that went to commercials instead of having people that were watching online watch somebody, you know, roll over in pain and be uncomfortable, they cut to commercials and little advertisements instead. So good for them for doing that, not... Saying, hey, look at this, your leg's gross. Yeah, it always sucks to get someone, watch someone get injured, you know, especially at a high-level match. And it, it does happen. It's part of the sport. But, you know, ups to Patty for, for getting the win. Kind of sucks the circumstances. But, you know, good match from both competitors. And, you know, I'll watch a rematch as soon as she heals up. Absolutely. On to the title fight. Kyle Terra versus Marcelo Cohen. This was exciting. You know, I, I always love watching Kyle compete. Do another small guy like myself. I think it was a 125 title, Josh. Yes. Nogi, so... You know, Kai Terra does it both, and he has the title already at 125, no gi. So I was super excited to watch this match. I mean, what can you say? The dude is a 8 billion time black belt world champion. 11 time black belt world champion. He's what, 35? I, I, is he? I think he's younger than that. Is he? He looks super young, but I actually looked at his age a couple of days ago. I think he's that old. Yeah. Which is crazy to me that him still at that level, at that age, and uh, getting it done still. Between him and Bruno Malfisane, like those two guys are always the top two. Dude, Gavalzo too. At, but those two are always the top two at rooster weight. Yeah. And, you know, Kai always talking about his candy diet, uh, that he had candy in like every drawer in his house, and how he still stays around at 125 pounds. Blows my mind. A small point of correction. Kai was actually 31, and I'm an idiot. But moving on to the match. It's a good match. Uh, it is. It is a good match. It's a good match with uh, the thesaurus not in front of us for this match. Um, 
Kai at one point looks like he's going to knee cut from standing, and uh, he goes for the knee cut and then just cuts, goes, you know what, I'm just going to cut over to mount. And so he ends up in mount. Marcelo tries to get the goat hooks in, and if you're not sure what a goat hook is, it's basically where the guy on the bottom of mount will put his legs in front of the person's torso and try to push him down. I'm not sure what other people call that. I've always learned that as a goat hook. And uh, if you do it correctly, you push the guy down and can see about the back door. And if you don't do it correctly, uh, you basically just look kind of weird. But Marcelo is 80% out the entire time. And eventually Kyle kind of abandons his position and he escapes out and they go back to the feet. So Kyle, Kyle, Kyle sits to guard and into half guard and he does his little knee shield Kyotera type thing. He immediately rolls over for an outside heel hook and then they start tangling up and it looks like, you know, he's about to go for a sharpshooter or a Texas Cloverleaf pro wrestling one, not the not the jujitsu one that everybody should know. And he starts putting the reap in. He's shooting he's the, the legs over across. Super hard too. It was it was great leg entanglement. It was exceptional. Exceptional leg entanglement. Not great, exceptional. And he just kept fighting it and then brought it across, grabbed up that heel hook, boom, takes it away. Yeah. Marcelo was like, I'm not messing around with this. I'm done. Yeah. I'm not going to roll out because his legs were just I'm telling a you, he had the knee, warbled mess. He had the knee turned. He had the legs controlled, the knees controlled. And there's really, you know, it didn't seem like there would be any way for him to get out. So he taps and finishes it. One really interesting piece that I thought about this match was you saw at one point in leg entanglement, Kayo, uh, Marcelo has Kayo's arm and his head trying to kind of bring him postured in so he can't extend on the legs. And Kayo brings his outside leg that's not controlling the knee across Marcelo's body and pushes him away at the torso. And then instead of usually what someone does when they put the leg across the torso, it ends up on the outside, the same side as the leg you're attacking. He pushes him away with the leg, breaks the hand grips, and then replaces his leg back to the outside so that he can't attack the, the heel hook. Uh, Marcelo can't attack the heel hook on him. And once he breaks the hand grip, basically he goes immediately for the heel hook and finishes it. It was a really interesting finishing sequence uh, that I enjoyed a lot. It was a satisfying... It... it... You see all these things going on, and it's just satisfying the way the finish happened where you're like, yes, yes, mm-hmm, good, I like what I'm seeing, boom. So, you know, it's like a good steak dinner. It was it was right on the spot. Transitioning out of Fight to Win yet again because, you know, it's that good old weekly thing, and they're actually done for the year, so now we have to wait all the way till January 12th. For the next fight, the win card. Which is actually a big gap for them. You know, usually they have three events a month. So the fact that they're taking off a whole month, taking off in quotes there, they're probably going to run fight to win nationals in that time. Taking I, off. It's it's the holiday season. I think everything past Nogi Worlds is really just toned down. Nobody wants to compete. You're spending money on gifts for people that you hate. Sometimes people that you like. Mostly the people that you hate. Josh, I like my family for the record. Yeah, sure. Whatever. And... You know, everybody's doing all this traveling and everything. You don't want to. You don't want to get ready for competition. You're you're coming out of eating a whole lot during Thanksgiving. You're eating a whole lot of cookies leading up to whatever holiday you subscribe to: Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Festivus, whatever. So it's a little light. In yeah, the, uh, in the January and late December months. Yes, there are. It is sparse. On the competitions. But this weekend we had Kasai Pro. Uh, Kasai Pro had three super fight matches as well as a 155 tournament. So the first match is Gordon Ryan versus Yuri Samoas. Samoas? Samoas? Again, before we get into this, commentary, Sean Williams, Josh Palmer, spot on. Oh, it was great. Whenever they did a throw in this commentary, they would know the judo name of the throw, which is so rare for anything that's not literally judo. So I love watching guys that know their techniques, know the different names for the techniques, and just say, oh, it's a big throw. It's like, oh, it's a Harigoshi. It's a Sumagaishi. And they knew the name. So I love watching, love hearing good commentary. That was that was a lot of Sean Williams. I don't know where Josh Palmer trains, but he had a lot of the same Henzo-ish knowledge that Sean Williams had. So I'm thinking maybe he trains there as well. I'm not 100% sure. I'm not too familiar with him but his voice did sound familiar they they knew everything you know you heard the 
inside Sankaku's, you heard, you know, Ashigarami's, you heard all of that. And again, it gives you the warm fuzzies when the commentary is just on point. So back to the match as we gush. Gordon starts out pulling guard. And he, you know, he's battling from half briefly and then goes to butterfly and does a push type kick and comes up. Yeah, when you say push type kick, it looks like he's on like uh, almost like combat base and just kicks Yuri in the chest. Yeah. And they, never, they didn't call it, but I looked, I was like, that was kind of a kick in the chest. Eh, well, it's it was, a, it was a push, but he kicks him in the chest. Yeah. And there were no points during these super fights until you would get to the overtime rounds if necessary. So it was a 10 minute These match. were 10 minutes and then six minutes. Yes. Yeah, with, with IBJJF points. And so we're going to get in here. The rules for this event were a little different, and there was some definitely some confusion in some of the matches with how the rules were and how the points worked. And we'll touch on that in just a little bit. But the scoreboard showed points, and then they were like, why are these here? And then the points went away. From there, Gordon was on top and aggressive, and he would go from cutting to center line to cutting the other way and he would continuously backstep but not sit on the hip he would be he would still be up because when he got pushed it would put him right into a knee cut position which is very interesting and i had watched that and then went to training and used that and it it worked really well Uh, and that was in the gi that wasn't even in no gi so that was a cool little pointer that I took away from that. Yeah, one thing that I watched a lot, I'm not sure if Draft, you can shed some light on this and educate me. Yuri had a really interesting grip for a lot of the match in like a Z guard, uh, but he would grab both of his hands on his own bottom leg when Gordon was kind of trying to pass. And I'm not sure exactly why he was doing that. And the commentary didn't really address it a ton, but it was a really interesting grip that I have not seen used a ton from that position. I haven't either. And I'm not surprised that the commentary team didn't say anything because I'm pretty sure they felt the same way. I picked up on that. I was like, what? what the hell is he doing? And it just kept Gordon sort of locked in to where he couldn't go anywhere. But Yuri wasn't as mobile, as active as he sometimes is. Right, because he has both hands trapped on his own leg. It was just a really interesting position, and I don't... I want to play with it because I I don't know what he was doing with it, but it was definitely working. It was definitely stopping Gordon from passing. Um, But he just... Because he couldn't get up on his shoulders, get up on his hands... He was really reliant on the legs and the Z shield and that bottom leg control of Gordon's leg to stop the pass. At one point, it kind of threatened Gordon, but he sat back and it stopped it. And then he, uh, Yuri bailed to deep path and got close, close to a sweep. But then a, Gordon transitioned again and just killed it. And he went back to that weird grip in Z guard but that started to all break down and Gordon you know did a throw by and got behind him he went double wrist grips for the back and just started lifting and immediately trapped the arm with one of the hooks it yeah, he trapped it. Like he got to the back, and then before the camera had a chance to change the angle, so you could see what they were doing for the hand fight, he had already trapped the hand. It was it was really really quick. And, and this is all in the last like forty five seconds of the regulation. Yeah, he doesn't get his back till right. You know, where there's there's not a whole lot of time to work, and you and you really think like, okay, does he have enough time to finish? You know, Gordon's a good finisher on the back. Absolutely. I mean, all those guys are, all the DDS guys are, but I just was like, I don't know if he has enough time to finish because Yuri's no slouch. No, I mean, again, both are ADCC champions. Both are very game, very high-level competitors, but Gordon just put on the rear naked choke uh, it wasn't a rear naked choke it was a cross it was a rear naked face it was a rear naked choke you have to realize you can't tuck your chin like everybody tells you that don't tuck your chin to defend the choke because what happens your face gets stuck in it you still get choked but your jaw gets destroyed as well and what happened his jaw got destroyed and he got choked because yuri's head started turning colors not like multiple but it got redder very red. red whatever and he tapped out 
Which was amazing. With 18 seconds left. Oh, yeah. Flow grappling. Stop posting spoilers. If I can't watch it as it happens, don't post an article. Gordon Ryan beats Yuri Samoyce in the dying seconds of their match. Well, thanks. You know, how about incredible must-see match? Give me a day. Give me a day and a half. Don't even give me a day and a half. You know, give me 18 hours. And this happened at like 8 o'clock at night. So, well, no. Then, yeah, maybe 24 hours. Yeah, but still. to watch it. Give me some time. But I will say this. They were, they were on top of getting these videos out. When I woke up in the morning, the, thing, the first thing on the page was watch all the videos from Kasai. So flow grappling sometimes has a, has a big gap of time between the time the Weeks. match happens <laughs> yeah, to the time Sounds that you can actually replay the video. So if you missed it that night, you know, a lot of these events go late at night. If you missed it, you missed it until the video comes back up. So it was nice to see I missed a section of Kasai last night. And this morning woke up and I was like, oh, the video's up. I can, you know, I don't have to go scrounge and talk to Josh or like find other sources for the video. I can watch it on flow right and where it should be. Fight to win was up really fast. Uh, normally it comes out Wednesday, Tuesday, uh, quick turnaround Sunday now. So yeah, it, it, great. Ca- it came out about midday today. So it was great to see that. Awesome, 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 awesome finish. Great match. Moving to the next one. Craig Jones versus Marillo Santana. Again, spoilers. It soured me on the match. I was like, I don't do I do I want to watch it? And this match had a weird had a very weird ending uh, for all people. Even the commentary staff was confused when the match ended exactly what happened. This is a rematch of a match we saw ADCC 2017. A couple weeks ago. And Again, the rule set was based around IBJJF. But all submissions were legal? Yeah. So, you know, it was a lot of back and forth. Craig sitting guard, Marillo backing off, and Craig getting annoyed that he was backing off. You know, sweep for sweep, two to two. Craig talks to the ref. And if you're uh, if you're aware of the IBJJF rules, that's a no-no. So you get a penalty. So, you know, he gets back up, boom, it's four to two. And Craig gets a stalling penalty. And then Marillo gets two points. I don't know how that happened. I was kind of confused too, because Craig was up four to two. And he was, you know, he was obviously trying to stall out the rest of the time. I think he had a minute or two minutes, not a whole lot of time left in the match. And he's trying to stall out, trying to stall out, trying to stall out. He's because you can realistically get two more disengaging penalties before you know you get DQ'd for disengaging, and so in a minute or two minutes, it's gonna be hard to obtain two penalties if you're doing anything. And so he's disengaging, and then at a certain point, the ref basically goes, "Okay, you've been disengaging too much. Here's your penalty," and then awards two points. And I don't think Gore, uh, I don't think Craig realized he had been. Basically, other that Merle had been given two points, and then the match finishes, I think, like 18 seconds or like 25 seconds later, and Craig looks over at the scoreboard and sees that it's tied and that he has two penalty points and that he's lost the match. And even the commentary thought that it was going to go into overtime, um, so everyone was confused here, and I'm still not exactly certain how the ref gave a penalty and two points well, for that situation. Being is that there were no advantages. There were negatives, but there were no advantages. Maybe they skipped out because your first penalty is a warning that you got a penalty, IBJJF-wise. The second one, you lose an ad. The third one, you lose two points. The last one, you're DQ'd. Well, if you take away the warning and giving your opponent the advantage, you immediately go to the points. So maybe that's how they run it. But you need to let people know that that's how you do it. Yeah, because Craig Jones didn't look like pretending to be surprised. He looked legitimately surprised that he had just lost two. I mean, he's been given up two points because I think if had he would have known that he would have, you know, he would have not stalled. And you, he's not a dumb guy. I mean, he knows he competes enough. He can learn a rule set and understand the gamesmanship behind a rule set. So he was very surprised. Even the commentary staff was surprised. So I think maybe that either wasn't communicated well or. 
that was an interpretation. I mean, obviously, to me at least, it was probably set in the rules if the ref decided to do it that way. But it was just a little weird to see to see it happen. It kind of sucked because Craig was up by two and lost via weird misunderstanding of the rules. I just kind of hate to see that. Yeah, it sucks, but it's the it's the first of hopefully many events, and they will start, you know, tweaking a few things and making it making it better. And I think now that we've seen this, their next event, even if they have the same rule set, it won't happen again because you guys will know, okay, your first thing is a penalty. Your second one is you lose the points, and your third one's a DQ. So, you know, that sucks to see. Interesting match overall, but it was just had a, had a weird finish that kind of solid a little for me. We need to get the third match. You know, we're now one and one. We need to finish the trilogy. Under our third super fight, Caitlin Huggins... H- H- Huggins? Huggins. Versus Raquel Pahului. Yeah, that sounds about... Yeah. Oh, you should just say Raquel Canudo. I'm going to go with Raquel for the rest <laughs> of this. So this was the third super fight match. Uh, Raquel comes out fast, gets the takedown. It was stopped a little early. Uh, it was an inside trip takedown, but they were really close to the edge of the mat, and the ref stopped it. Didn't really give three seconds for control. We started in the center and then awarded points. And... Caitlin and her corner were kind of confused as to why the points had been awarded. And so Caitlin's standing straight up. They'd restarted. And her you can see her corner in the background yelling to her or to the ref. And she looks over to her corner, still standing straight up. And the match has been restarted for three to five seconds now. And Raquel goes, cool, shoots a blast double across the mat, takes her down. That was That was something that happened throughout the night to where people would get taken down at the edge or they would stop it right as the takedown was about to be completed or, you know, people were thrown out of the ring, literally. And a couple, a couple guys fell off the mat. Yeah. It was a little more common than I'm used to because fight to win is also elevated. You don't really see guys fall off the mat. Who knows? But again, if we're following IBJJF rules, if you take somebody down out of bounds, you're you're if you're in the motion and they're either fleeing to prevent that from happening or you land it i mean again i know there's no ads but you got to get something you got something's got to start in a better position tiny little gripes little things that were bothering me anyway back to the match and main going on with it yeah it was it was interesting so she takes you down gets the blast double so now she's up four um then they go back and forth a little bit. Caitlin gets a takedown shortly after, so now it's two to four. Um, and, and that's actually the only points that she would get in the entire match. Caitlin had a single leg, and Raquel gets a front headlock a little later and controls her as they come down, and they give the points to Raquel. And so it was 6-2 with eight minutes left. And so this has all happened in the first two minutes of the match. Um, from there, it's really just Raquel on top going for a Darce. She's stuck in the like a top quarter guard for pretty much the entire match. Um, and so she never gets points for mount or for back mount because she's always kind of stuck in that, that top three-quarter guard, a top mount, uh, but never gets the points. Goes for a Darce, goes for a head and arm, goes for a, a bunch of different submissions, goes for the gift wrap, tries to take the back. She can never turn the angle and fully get around to anything to get any additional points. And the match ends six to two. That was that was all the super fights for the night. Now we get to the groups, groups A and B. Uh, again, it was next day that we're watching it, and they did not break down who was in what and how it was. How it was it was broken down in groups. So you just see here's a whole bunch of matches, and you would hear commentary before and after, and you're like, okay, I need to switch through this match. So the first match was Gianni Grippo versus Enrico Coco. And a lot of Gianni's matches went this way where he was in the best position but didn't have the finish from there or couldn't complete the the sweep or anything like that, would get 95% of the way and then go back down. So I don't... <laughs> I'm assuming he's he's he knows the leg lock game, and I'm assuming he know and I know he knows how to take the back. It's just the aggressiveness wasn't there. He's a great competitor to watch, but there was just something missing to where it wasn't finishing to where he was more dominant. 
where he could have gotten points and potentially ended up in the finals. So Coco, of course, is known for attacking the legs and just being super gritty. And he attacked the legs at first. And then Grippo's De La Hiva was the stopping point of anything Coco was trying to do. Grippo would go underneath. He would try to get something. And then it would go back. And that's how the match went. The yeah, rest... A lot of back and forth. The entire match just sort of start to go, start to get something going, start to get something going, and didn't quite get there. And boom, draw. So they each get a point for that. So how the Kasai worked uh, is you have Group A and Group B. You have guys on each side. And all those guys on each side go against each other. And if you get a draw, you get one point each. If you get a win via points, you get... Two uh, points. Two points. And if you would get win via sub, you get three points. The winner of Group A goes against the winner of Group B for the title. title. And then the two uh, second-place finishers go against for third place. Yeah, even how that was decided was kind of confusing to me because a lot of people had the same amount of points, but they just threw people together. So... Inaugural event, you're gonna have things that are a little odd. Yeah, um, I like I've I've seen that format before or a similar format. Oh, you don't say like in Copa Podio? Yeah, yeah, it was the same exact format, except for it was slightly smaller, and yeah. So, next match in Group A was Celsino versus Junio Casio. Junio is their uh, qualifier guy. That won the tournament. I think he's a purple belt that subbed a couple, three, three black belts to get in to this event, won their qualifier. And so that's who he is. That's why you probably haven't heard his name a ton. And I said that Celso was the dark horse of the tournament. I just felt that way because he was a little bit older. It's not like he's a game competitor, but man, Juni was, was impressive. The way he just, he took it to everyone. He didn't give a shit and just, was playing guard a lot, what, 95% of the time, and being aggressive with the De La Hiva and reverse De La Hiva and his inversions, and wouldn't let anybody pass his guard. Like, that is going to be a scary black belt in a few years. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he's a frightening purple belt when Obviously. you see that guy's name in the division and you're around the, you know, New York area and you're like, oh, shit, I don't want to compete against that guy. It was. Celso trying to pass the entire time and not being able to pass. And that was the entire six minutes of the match. That was something of the night for the most part where a lot of these ended in draws. I think they need like more incentive for something to yeah. finish or it kind of whatever. Like EBI has their way of doing it. I think you can come up with another way that's not just EBI rules, but it was... A lot of the matches, especially in the preliminaries, are 0-0, zero, 1-1, zero, one, one, or... 2-2. Two, two. Two, You're not two. getting one point. But, right. yeah, it was, here's this, here's that, here's this, here's that. And it was a lot of just draw, 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 draw. Going to the B block, you had Gary Tonin versus Munchie, Mansur Kara. It was very back and forth, very explosive, Everybody's looking for takedowns. Gary seemed kind of like aloof where he would just let people grab stuff and he would try to finish it with that Kimura takeover. I mean, his arm drags were on point. His yeah. takedowns, very good, a good takedowns. Wrestler. Everyone kind of forgets a little yeah, bit. Yeah, people forget that he's a, a good wrestler. Did he wrestle at Rutgers? No, I think he does the BJJ club there. Okay. I, I and he had some involvement with Rutgers. I thought he, he had wrestling background before he, he started. He's still, he's, his wrestling is on par. Not like superb where it's but for jiu -jitsu, world beat. It's great for jujitsu. Yeah. But it was a very back and forth match. And it again ended in a draw. So boom, that's a point for both of them. You're my favorite bad guy, AJ Agazarm versus Hanato Canuto. That was sort of the real dark horse. We we, it would, I've heard his name, but I've seen him compete mostly in the gi when I have seen him, but I don't know too much about him. But man, was he impressive the entire night. Just, just jumping guard and 
flying arm bars and just going. He caught AJ quite a few times, slipping, sleeping. I don't know, but he nabbed up some subs, but just couldn't finish it because AJ is super stubborn and, and he's good too. Yeah, yeah. It's not not, not our favorite grappler, but he's he's good. And he's got he again. He's another guy with underrated wrestling, and we'll get into that a little later as well with another matchup. He did wrestle in college, but you know, not oh, yeah. anything mind blowing. So uh, another draw. So there we are. Boom. Everybody is tied right now with one point a piece moving into round two. Enrico Coco. Boom. Versus Johnny Acasio. Back and forth. Johnny again, or Junie, excuse me, not Johnny. Junie. Do my thing, Josh. Yeah, I am. Messing up the names. Yes. Again, back to guard, inversions, reverse De La Hiva, De La Hiva, all that kind of stuff. And Coco couldn't do anything about it. Yeah, Judy really impressed me here. Just like I expected, I usually expect the dudes that qualify to go, you know, have one good showing and then just stomp through the rest of it. And so two matches in a row, he's like, he's really impressed me. Yeah, again, going to be a scary dude to deal with in a couple of years. Jumping over to Grippo versus uh, Celso. Same thing. Celso on top, trying to pass. Gianni working the kiss of the dragon, working his De La Hiva, almost getting things but not getting it. So, again, another draw. Boom. So everybody in block A right now is all tied up. Everybody, One point apiece for everybody. Everyone. Well, now we're into round two. So actually those everybody in block A have two points. Right. But... Not anything impressive. Going to round two of group B, B block, whatever you want yeah. to call it. Hanato Canudo versus uh, Munch. Muncher. Mancher Kara. There were some questionable positions to where they were scored. It was an interesting match. I thought the scoring on it was a little, I'm not going to say lenient, but... They said you had to have control for three seconds. A lot of times, like, they would get a lift and put them down and then... Points. Points. So it didn't it didn't fully make sense to me how they kept scoring it, but Hanato just started running away with the points, and it ended up at... 12 and 0 at tw- the end. Yeah. We have a result here that listed as 10 and 0, but on the scores at the end of the match, it said 12 and 0. And so and the scoreboard got kind of funky with it too. So yeah, there was a couple of times with the scoreboard, they would change the score. They would move the score. They would award, award the points too early on the scoreboard and then take them away and then add different points. And this was definitely one of those matches where you're watching the score and the commentary staff was good about explaining like why points are being taken off or put back on if there were mistakes made, but it was still, this was a little complicated to watch for the scoring. Yeah. And, and it was confusing to, the commentary and sometimes the competitors and the coaches, you would see them peek over and they would make a face and you, you were like, what, huh? Why? What? You'd look and see, Oh, okay. It's six to six to two. And then you look back and it's four to two. So again, small little things that hopefully they tweak when they do their next event. It's it's an inaugural event. You're, we understand that there's going to be stuff like that that happens, especially when they're doing an IBJJF rule set, but not quite. You know, there's a couple of modifications and a couple of things that work in IBJJF that once you take out advantages and some other things are a little different. And so, you know, we saw that here. Exactly. Second round, second match of the second round for B block, Gary Tonin defeated AJ Agazarm hits a, so many awesome takedown attempts, so many awesome transitions comes up on top, gets the two points and that's where it went. It was very back and forth. It Gary, was a wrestling match for a good portion. Yeah, and Gary would give stuff up and then just like do turnovers. There was an awesome funk roll. All all sorts of things were happening. Uh, they had the whole time, they, a lot of the stand-up, they had that interlacing hand grip that certain guys love to do, but both of them were really committed. And you see Gary trying to break that grip where he brings his foot up and basically pushes on um, AJ's bicep to break the hand grip to come under. It was an interesting match. You kind of forget because they kind of committed to wrestling so much on the feet because the points were so important, how 
how good Gary's wrestling is and how good AJ's wrestling is. Everyone, again, kind, kind of sleeps on that and forgets that these dudes both can wrestle a little bit when it comes down to it. And at one point, Gary did have a triangle on, and everybody's like, ooh, this might be finished. AJ just slips her right out the back. Just slips right on out. So Hanato and a, uh, Gary now have three points apiece. Munch and AJ have one point apiece. And everybody in B block or A block has two points. So you've got two guys now vying for the first place in B block before round three. So it's up in the air at the moment. Round three. This one, this match was the only submission. So this is the only submission of the tournament. Celso Vinicius choked the shit out of Enrico Coco with the guillotine. I mean, he stayed on it and walked him to the edge and he did, he choked him unconscious while he was still like s- sort of standing up like in a squatted position, but he was still up and you hear Sean Williams like he's out, he's out way before the ref was aware that he was out. The ref was like, I'm going to let it go till he dies. And you know, that match was less than two minutes. Awesome guillotine. That, now puts him at five points, which because he gets a submission, so he gets he gets three points. He really is now the big front runner out because he has so many additional points. Well, that that gives him it. This is the third round. He's you know competed against everybody else. Boom, that puts you in the finals with five points. So Grippo or Acasio would have had to submit one another to to go to the finals to to go to the finals or figure out a way to get in there because whoever would have won. Both would have had five points, so I don't know how they decide tiebreakers. But Grippo and Acasio go to a draw. Acasio forced Grippo to be on top and kept it there. Again, he made Grippo work. And again, big shout out to Junior Acasio. I'm going to be keeping an eye on this guy. Oh, definitely. He, You're keeping pace with all these world-class black belts. All of these guys you hear about all the time. Yeah, we've been talking about this card for a couple weeks now because we were so excited about all the names on it, and you're keeping pace with the guys that we're excited to see. Like, you now become a guy that I'm excited to see. Yes, So absolutely. I hope we see him on more super fights, yes. more events, fight to wins, or you know wherever he can get on because he's proved to me at least that, hey, you can hang with these guys, and you're not getting subbed, and you're not getting finished by the top guys. So... Hey, fight to win. Hey, EBI. Hey, whoever. Put this dude on the cards. Third round of Group B. Hanato Canudo versus Gary Tonin. This is another another match where, you know, quick scoring happened, where you're you were kind of confused. So Canuto wins 4-0. It was very, AJ, again, very aloof, loose, or not AJ, I'm sorry, Gary, loose, just moving, transitioning really well, but just lost the points and could not catch back up. And that gave Canuto the win with five points of the block. Munch beat Agazarm on on a sweep, a beautiful sweep. Or a bad transition, really, where he was it, was... it was a bad transition on AJ's part. It was still smart sweep where he came up off of AJ trying to do a submission, gets the points, settles, almost nails mount. And, you know, that's how the match ends. Six minutes, not a lot of work to do. I mean, there were short matches, which kind of may explain why there were so many decisions because guys just didn't quite have enough time to fill each other out and then get into it and then move through good and bad positions and, you know, get a sub on a guy. So before the finals match happened, the third place match happened. Gianni Grippo versus Gary Tonin. I don't know how they decided Grippo was going to go for third because he and Acasio both had three points apiece. So... I don't know how they how what the what's the word I'm searching for tiebreaker. What, what was the tiebreaker for them to who was going into the the match? I don't know. I'm not going to question it. It was it was a good match, so I'm not going to complain. Gianni beat Gary six to four. Quick sweeps were happening. Gary at one point 
let Gianni come behind him and get into that sort of crab ride position. And he just held on to the feet to stop it. But it seemed a little almost lazy on Gary's part. He just accepted that that was going to happen and he figured he was going to fight out of it. And he got himself in a hole again and not too deep of a hole. He was only down by two. And still, it's weird to see, you know, usually Gary's a pretty uh, guy that knows the rules. Gamesmanship is pretty good with understanding. He's it. a pretty guy. He's a pretty good guy. Pretty guy. Main, main thinks Gary Tonin is a pretty guy. Shout out Gary Tonin for being Maine's favorite pretty guy. <laughs> so Gianni takes third place. The finals match, they both got a penalty at one point. It went to it went the whole ten minutes. Nobody really scored. It goes into the overtime round. Cool little thing that they did was they gave them a minute break and then they had a two minute sort of sudden death. It was back and forth, but Hanato Canuto was just more aggressive, and the refs gave it to him at the end. So, Josh, what do you think about the decision? What do you think about? I think it, it was good. I think it was the right decision. I I feel that Canuto was just in, aggressive the entire night. And just kept moving forward and kept attacking. He almost had several takedowns. He got behind him. He almost had the back. Do you think he's just more active in that? That was just more active, and that's what got it for him. So Hanato Canuto is your inaugural Kasai lightweight champion. Keep doing what you're doing, guys. Tweak a few things, but keep doing what you're doing. And I am all for your success. They can put this level of talent on following events. Like I will watch them every time. Absolutely. Congrats on the good on the first event. Fun to watch. Hope to see you around again. Like we were talking about last week too. I'm not going to say he was super local. He's up in Philly, but all around good guy. Jared Weiner was on the card as well and on the undercard, and he takes his match by, you know, in the last minute kind of thing where his opponent grabbed something and Jared being the smart competitor that he was, came up, technically a sweep, boom, two, and then the match finished. So shout out to Jared for taking his match. So that wraps up this week. Uh, It wasn't the huge week like last weekend. I'm honestly kind of happy for that, Josh. Yeah, it was a a little lighter. My eyes aren't bleeding from all the grappling I'm watching. Coming up next week, Nogi Worlds. We've been talking about it. We don't have anything to go by other than the competitor list. Yeah, if you're curious about it, the ones we're looking at, last week's episode, Josh runs through the guys that we're looking at. Um, we don't have brackets out yet, so we can't really preview or speculate. I don't like speculation because you can say one thing and just crazy stuff happens. So, you know, look at the competitor list. Pick out your favorite guy. Hope he goes far. We'll discuss how the brackets were broken down next week and... We'll go from there. So that is what's next week. After that, we've we've got our little bit of a break from all the competitions. The next two things that are coming up don't happen until January 12th. Fight to win Pro 58 in Sacramento, California, and Abu Dhabi Grand Slam in Abu Dhabi. So Which those are the two events. Both will be awesome. I believe the headlining match of Fight to Win Pro 58 is Mr. Co- Mr. Competition Wagner Hosha versus... versus Dustin Akbari. That's correct. And that is, that's going to be a barn burn. That's going to be a really exciting match. I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to have a couple weeks off. Like, you know, see how was such a long break, Josh. I know. Not competing every single weekend. We come from this weekend too. Oh, I don't know. I think he was off this weekend. Finally, first time in like six weeks. Yeah, Yeah, the first time in like six weeks. First episode ever, we have not covered Mr. Hosha. (laughs) Well, we're talking about him now, but just not competing wise. We're never not going to talk about him. (laughs) Probably. So that's that. Uh, if Abu Dhabi's uh, competitor list is not up yet. Even it's a month away. So as soon as we find out anything, we'll let you guys know. Uh, keep an eye on their website. You'll be able to pick out some guys as well. And look out for our top 10 show coming out during that drought week. We'll break down the top 10 matches we saw for 2017. If you're going to rewatch during the drought, that'll be in two weeks. We're going to be breaking those down after Worlds. And be on the lookout for the top 10 uh, audio fuck-ups by Josh and Maine. That wraps up this week of the Grappling Rewind podcast. Again, light week, but... Good matches. Good matches. This week, I'm not complaining that it was a light week. 
As always, you can email us at thegrapplingrewind at gmail.com. You can check us out on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, and pretty much anywhere you can find Facebook podcasts. We're on Facebook, Grappling Rewind. Instagram. Grappling Rewind. Twitter. Grappling Rewind. Reach out to us on social media. If you got something that you want us to cover, you want to clarify, you know, we are here. You want to tell us we're idiots. Hey, let us know. You want us to pronounce your name correctly? Let us know. Subscribe. Subscribe on the YouTube page. Leave us a review. Helps us out a lot. It helps us out. And, you know, it eventually will help you out. We like to give back. We're doing this as something that isn't done. So help us help you. Again, as always, I'm Josh. I'm Maine. And this is the Grappling Rewind Podcast. We'll see you on the mats.